Thank you very much, everyone, for coming um, and joining me for the last session of today. Uh, I am very excited to uh, be able to present today. My name is Wu Qi. I originally come from China and have been living in Germany for over five years. Um, uh, after I finished my master's degree in mass, uh, statistics, I started to work as a machine learning engineer at Ontolox. And today my topic is um, compressed giant language models using knowledge distillation, which is um, a popular method among other model compression methods. We will come, uh, come back to that later. So before I start with the topic, I would like to shortly present our company, Neophony Group. Um, we are a digital agency based in Berlin, and over 20 years, we are experiences uh, we have experiences in the field of content management, e-commerce, mobile, and um, um, operations. And uh, Ontolox is a brand of Neophony. Since 2021, we are providing state-of-the-art AI solutions to our customers. And as a meanwhile, we are also developing our own research project. Uh, at Ontolox, we are specialized in text mining, uh, machine learning, and search. Our product, uh, TextVec, for example, is a lightweighted uh, text analysis framework which, uh, where we focus on German text uh, analysis. There, we try to combine the traditional expert system together with the modern machine learning algorithm and thus provide our users many useful functions, such as named entity recognition, entity linking, uh, sentiment analysis, and so, and so on. So the agenda of today's talk is I will first uh, talk about uh, the motivation, why we were interested in the first place about model compression and knowledge distillation. And secondly, I would introduce um, a couple of uh, com popular um, model compression method that's existing now on the market. And um, uh, afterwards, uh, I will introduce you our own implementation and experiment with knowledge distillation. And we will discuss about the result. And at the end, uh, I'm also happy to answer all the questions. Um, so let us start. Um, I think we all would agree that uh, we are now living in an exciting time of artificial intelligence. There were, um, we were often quite overwhelmed by how those AI models perform uh, in mining application scenarios, such as uh, writing poetry, uh, generating images, doing art, composition. Even though all of these things are fascinating, but on the other hand, they are also a little bit intimidating. <laughs> um, and um, however, the models, AI models are performing better and better. Uh, significantly. However, the model sizes are also growing uh, bigger and bigger exponentially. As we can see here on the graph, um, that's, uh, from, that's the most popular NLP model and successful ones uh, since 2018 until today. And um, uh, we can see that from millions of parameters such as BERT, uh, until billions of parameters such as GPT-3, we didn't take that long of a time. And that brought us many problems. The first one is the environmental burden. Um, as we can all imagine that big models would consume a lot of energy, but I think most of us um, don't know how, how big this figure actually is. Uh, because people don't like to talk about it. Like, they would like to talk about how well my model performs, but they are reluctant to, uh, to report or how much energy my model consumes. Um, and there are like, uh, some figures that was uh, researched and published um, um, by the researchers, and um, so, uh, which is quite astonishing, because um, the training and experimenting process of a transformer model uh, with around 200 pa uh, million parameters, which means less than BERT, uh, it generates um, four times as much of uh, the carbon dioxide in comparison to an average uh, car throughout its whole lifetime. 
So that's the first problem. And the second problem is the cost, because uh, in order to make a um, giant um, language model to uh, work, you also need an adequate hardware support or cloud um, uh, computation options, which are all not cheap. And uh, the third one is uh, the speed. Because the, more, uh, the, the bigger the model is, the longer time you would need at inference time. And that's like problematic in many, many use cases. So what are the solutions? Um, the idea is that uh, we would like to have small and efficient models that um, also don't lose so much on the uh, performance as a meanwhile. And there are already um, a lot of methods uh, in the literature how to uh, compress the model. And I will, among others, I would go through the methods that's listed on the slide one by one. The first one is called uh, it's numeric precision reduction, which is also called quantization. So because all the weights and biases in the uh, matrices is saved in the, um, as a numeric value in the form of a float 32, so intuitively we could think about, OK, maybe we don't need that um, high of a precision, and we could just cut, um, the, uh, cut uh, them into a float uh, 16 or integer 8 and, uh, in order to uh, achieve model compression. And in TensorFlow, for example, we already have like implemented functions uh, for this uh, for this kind of situation. However, uh, sometimes we can also not naively just cut all the weights and biases in the model because some of the computations in a neural network do need a, a um, higher precision of uh, float 32. And luckily, in PyTorch, we also have the um, implemented package that uh, would allow us to automate the, uh, this process. Uh, the second method is uh, weight sharing, which is also called quantization, because uh, the logic is the same. We would like to represent a huge model with lower precision and thus achieve model compression. Take here um, the matrix here, weight matrix here as an example. Let's say we have like a four by four weight matrices and then um, the, we could cluster them according to their values and um, all the same values in the same cluster would only be represented uh, by the same short. So in this way, instead of having a four by four matrix with 32 bytes each, now we only need like a mat uh, index uh, matrix which indicate uh, which cluster uh, the value belongs to, which is only two bytes unit, and then uh, the same short of each cluster. And in this procedure, it's um, also uh, quite common that we would um, per, um, that we will do like a fine tuning process in order to further calibrate the um, model and then secure the performance of the model. Um, the, set the third method is also quite straightforward. It's uh, pruning, because in a giant neural network, uh, not necessarily all the weight are important for, the, for our output. So in this case, we could just think about uh, just uh, cutting all the unnecessary weight. There are uh, structured um, pruning where you take out all the whole filter or like a whole neuron together with, all, with its all connections. There are also unstructured pruning where you only um, take out uh, the individual weights. And we also have a mathematical approach uh, to this. Uh, as we all have learned in linear algebra, we could uh, repre um, reconstruct a big matrix M in this case, with the two smaller one, L and R. And when the rank of matrix M is bigger than the number K here, then we could approximate the matrix uh, with a lower precision. Um, and uh, we also have uh, knowledge distillation, which is um, our main focus today. Uh, this method is a little bit different than all the methods I have um, introduced before, because uh, in knowledge distillation, we don't try to represent a big model with lower precision, or uh, we don't cut it small. Uh, a new model would be trained in this case. 
um, in the language of new uh, knowledge distillation, we call the big uh, and powerful model that's energy consuming, uh, the teacher model, and we call the small and efficient model the student model. And we would uh, build the loss function of the student model in the way that uh, we encourage it to mimic the behavior of the teacher model. And in this case, we take the output of the teacher model and then build it into the loss function of the student model. And the output, in this case, we call it knowledge. Um, so, we have introduced a lot of methods before. Why, um, us as a company, why do we choose knowledge distillation? Uh, the first reason is that in knowledge distillation, the student architecture is quite flexible. It could be independent from the teacher architecture. And uh, we want uh, that kind of flexibility, so that's the main reason. And there's also an, another advantage, uh, because the new model will be trained in this case. Theoretically, we could use an existing teacher model to generate uh, as much as training samples for our students. So that's also another advantage. Uh, so how does it exact works exactly? Uh, I take here an example um, of uh, an NLP task, uh, which is a named entity recognition. So basically, you have a string of text, and then the model has to predict in which uh, words in the text that belongs to um, named entity. And typically, there are four different classes, uh, organization, person, location, and miscellaneous, which means it belongs to named entity, but not uh, the three classes. And here, I take an example. It's the word European Union, and I fit it into both the teacher model and the student model. The teacher model would give uh, me an output to tell me, OK, how much is the probability that um, this entity um, belongs to class, organization, person, and location? and the student as well. And then based on those two values, we could build like a, M, a we could construct a mean square error uh, loss in order to encourage the student to uh, mimic um, the output of the, of, the, of the teacher. And in this case, if we would have labeled data, um, then we could also configure the loss function in a way that it's um, partly contains the distillation loss, which is in this case mean square error, and on the other hand, also the loss against the true data labeling, which is normally the uh, cross entropy loss. So the idea of uh, knowledge distillation has been um, was there. Uh, since 2015, it was firstly published in 2015, uh, and uh, ever since then, people um, are inspired by this idea and had a lot of exp um, their own implementation um, and exploration about this method. And we can say that here in uh, 2021, uh, there is a nice um, paper that summarizes all those uh, uh, trials. Uh, today, we would, however, only focusing on um, the two different types of knowledge, and, uh, three different types of knowledge uh, that's used in knowledge distillation, and then three different types of uh, distillation scheme. So the first question that we might ask us in knowledge distillation is, what is knowledge? In the previous example, we have the European Union um, that the model would tag um, and say that this, this probably uh, belongs to your organization. So that kind of uh, knowledge is, um, takes the output of the teacher model, or the final layer, and we call this kind of knowledge response-based knowledge. Um, however, in a giant neural network, there are also a lot of hidden information um, um, between the layers. So there are also a lot of uh, approaches that tries to um, take these uh, information and name it uh, feature-based uh, feature knowledge and try to train a student model based on this knowledge. And there are a third type of knowledge that's uh, different than, the, uh, different than the, um, uh, both of them. Uh, because these two uh, kind of knowledge, they all take the output of uh, of um, of the our teacher model. 
However, uh, the third uh, type of knowledge is called relation-based knowledge, uh, where they assume that in a big neural network, there is an information or a structure how the values are changing from layers to layers. So they try to model um, the correlation between different, uh, different layers and then uh, use that correlation as the relation-based knowledge to train a student model. So there are various different ways uh, how, how we could uh, utilize knowledge distillation. And there are also different training schemes. So the most common one is called uh, offline di and distillation, where you already have a pre-trained teacher model, and then uh, you uh, use it to generate the uh, training samples for the student and train the student. However, in some cases, the teacher model could not be available, so you can try to train the teacher and students together at once, and then we call this online distillation. And there's a, also an interest, very interesting uh, case where when the architecture of the student is exactly the same as the teacher, we call it self-distillation. And in this case, it's not about model uh, compression anymore, but uh, more about um, an exploration of what would happen. And even though in theory we don't yet have a proof why this would uh, improve the, the model performance, in practice, in the experiments they, they do. Um, so after we have, uh, we have introduced a lot of theoretical uh, knowledge about uh, model compression and knowledge distillation, now we are curious, how well do those models work? Uh, to answer that question, uh, I choose uh, this uh, paper that uh, has a very good summary. Uh, because um, um, I think uh, probably most, uh, many of us are familiar with the model BERT that was already mentioned a couple of times in the previous talk from today. Uh, so um, a lot of people try to distill the model BERT after the uh, idea of knowledge distillation have, um, have came out. And this paper is a very good summary of how people have tried different methods to distill the model BERT. We can see here like the method quantization, pruning, knowledge distillation from different, uh, from different type of uh, the knowledge, and the matrix decomposition, which is the low, low rank factorization we mentioned before. And uh, so, in general, the um, there are, there are uh, three different types of measures um, to measure how, how well a distilled model works. The first one is a model size reduction. And um, in this case, they are, they are um, uh, ranging from 58% to 99%. And then the second one is a speed up, it's, which ranges from 1.2 times to 25 times. And then the third one is the average performance drop, which ranges in um, our cases from minus uh, 0 0.1 to minus 12. So this is like a wide range because um, all those different methods, they, are, um, um, they have different purposes, they try different methods. So that's why we can say like there's a wide range of the, of the performance. Um, I have taken as an example a popular um, um, distilled model, which is called distilled bird. And in, in this specific case, um, the model is taking the same architecture as bird, but uh, with uh, less layers and then less hidden dimensions. Um, and then they in also initialize the model with the original bird weights. Uh, the model size re reduction for this uh, bird is about 40%, and then with a speed up of uh, around six, uh, 60%. Uh, and the average performance drop is only 3%. Yeah. So that's a pretty good trade off that we have here. So um, it is also very reasonable that we can uh, distill a general language model, and then we can, could fine tune it for speci specific use cases. Um, however, um, as a, a company, we decided to go the other way uh, because all, most of the existing uh, language models, um, they mainly focus on the English language. And for us as a company, our main target is German. 
So um, we would like to uh, distill the model that's a specific good in German language tasks. And then second of all, we have different data from different uh, projects, which is not only contents-wise, but also structure-wise very different from each other. So a domain adoption is anyway like a um, um, task for us. So we decided uh, in one of our projects, we have the German um, named entity recognition task. Uh, and we have chosen for that the Flare model as a state-of-the-art uh, NER model as our teacher model. This model uses um, XMLMR uh, with document level as the model structure. Um, so for those who are not, not familiar with those, XLMR stands for cross-lingual uh, uh, language model, and R stands for Rob beta, which is just basically an improved version of uh, BERT. Um, this model use, um, also uses document level features. So um, the question now is how to train the, the student models. Um, there are a couple of questions that we have to answer in these cases because we need to choose the architecture of the student model. It is flexible from the uh, uh, teacher and the embeddings and the training data. So uh, for the architecture choose, uh, most of the existing models are mostly, um, nowadays the most popular architecture is uh, transformer arch architecture. Um, however, uh, before the architecture mod, uh, transformer architecture came to the picture, um, um, recurrent neural network um, based model is also performs also quite good. And it has the advantage that when the model size is small enough, it actually outperforms transformer model. So for our use cases, we decided to take um, uh, RNN based um, uh, model as our student model. And for embeddings, we have chosen the um, popular and conventional glove embedding because we already lost the um, semantic information from a transformer model. That's why we would like to have a pre-trained uh, word embedding that's already context, uh, um, a lot of um, um, semantic information. And lastly is the data, because as we mentioned that uh, the trans uh, we could uh, train as much as uh, possible uh, of uh, training data for our student model. So, um, so how much should we train? We also, uh, for to answer that question, we also looked at into the literature and, um, um, and the result is that a combination of the training data of the teacher together with the newly uh, tag data from the and teacher model would the be best for the result. So after all the uh, considerations, we have trained our model, and then we have like uh, this nice table which shows that the result of our student model, which is not not bad. So we have like a um, uh, average uh, drop of performance around three percent. And however, the inferencing time is almost 40 times as uh, fast as the student model, which is a good result. However, um, so is that all? Is our model good enough for the production use? Um, now we have a problem that's not only um, relevant in knowledge distillation, but also in general for um, um, machine learning model training, because um, uh, the problem is that our validation set is usually not representative enough for real-life real, uh, data distribution. And uh, we have uh, made an experiment in our um, company that, um, so those two models have exactly the same size. However, the first one is deeper. It has a two-layer uh, LSTM, and the second one uh, is wider, so it only have one layer, but with a more hidden dimension. When we look at the score, it looks pretty similar. However, when we are testing it on the real data, one model performs significantly uh, like worse than the other one. Um, so what I wanted to, the message I wanted to um, express here is that model selection is a complex problem, and then because of the black box characteristic of the neural uh, network, um, maybe the only way to get uh, um, the right answer is by try and error. 
Uh, so experience do matter in, in these cases. Uh, there are also a lot of things that we uh, consider about uh, doing uh, in the future. Uh, we could, um, we have to optimize our evaluation process, which means maybe a manually la uh, labeling data of the evaluation set could be necessary. And um, we also wanted to change the student architecture because we were also curious about if we would take a transformer uh, model, how, how well it would come perform uh, in comparison to the uh, RNN-based uh, model. And then maybe we can also generate more training data and then see how the, how the result looks like. And uh, lastly, since knowledge distillation is not um, um, we, we could easily combine knowledge distillation with all the other methods we uh, mentioned uh, before. So um, we do have a lot of use cases of uh, our distillate um, model. Uh, we uh, embed it into our framework TextVec, that's uh, what I mentioned before. It's one of our company's product. Uh, where uh, we are using the expert system to uh, enable a lot of text ana uh, analysis functions. And, um, and we also use a distilled model in different projects. In DEOS, uh, for example, the Digital Environment Urban Solutions is a European-wide project that we are working with many other organizations. Uh, we have environmental data there, and then for uh, the Federal Ministry of uh, Finance in Germany, we have legal data. And then for each of the different use cases, we use the same technique of knowledge distillation, but then um, we have a different configuration of how the students look like, the word embedding that we'll choose, uh, which is uh, all specific uh, in, in each use cases. So uh, that will be all for the talk today. So um, as a conclusion, I wanted to say that um, um, I think we should, um, I think that going bigger and bigger shouldn't be the only direction that we are looking at, because at the end of the day, we don't want to create an AI model that replaces us as human, but um, for it to replace the boring work that humans are reluctant to do. And it's really useful to just have more smaller models which are uh, suitable for um, um, a specific occasions. Maybe, maybe it doesn't sound as cool as having a general AI that's capable of doing everything, but it's very useful and energy saving. So that will be all for my talk today. Um, I'm, I'm here for any questions. Thank you very much. It was very interesting. So, there are questions, I think. Everyone who lifts a hand, I will come over and then you're the first and then you, yeah? Thanks for the uh, great talk. Yeah. Um, did you measure um, like power requirement reductions on uh, your use cases? Sorry? You, did you measure the power requirement reductions? The power re uh, for us, we just use CPU because we choose like a relative small model that's also um, possible to run a, on a CPU device. Like the end device could be like a cell phone and uh, small devices. Yeah. Who was next? Yeah. Madam? So my question is similar. Um, you mentioned at the beginning that uh, such a model can consume up to four times uh, what a car is consuming. Uh, how much is your model consuming? <laughs> <laughs> well, um, I don't have an exact measure, but definitely le much, much less than that. Because uh, in, uh, So why it's this four times um, of carbon dioxide? Um, co in comparison to like a US car is because they use, um, in order to generate this kind of general language model, so you need to train the model with a um, huge amount of data. And the whole training process like uh, consumes a lot of energy. And in our cases, 
we are using a small model for a very specific case. So for us, we have our own uh, GPU session at uh, the company, and then the training procedure only takes um, around five hours with our own GPU. And then even though I don't have like exact number of how much energy that consumes, but it's uh, definitely not comparable for all those uh, giant models that's on the market now. Yeah. Sounds great. Thank you. <laughs> Is there anyone else? Oh, wow. Thank you. Uh, I know it's maybe not the biggest focus of the talk, but could you elaborate a bit on the, um, the self-distillation process? What's the exact goal? Uh, is it just uh, trying to optimize the performance, or is there anything other? The self-distillation procedure? Yes, that you mentioned briefly on yes. one of the slides. Do you want to go back to the slide? Um, okay. It's, oh, it's can you please me. repeat your question? <laughs> Sorry. Um, what, um, what is, since we're not uh, trying to get gains on, uh, on energy consumption because the number of parameters is not changing, what uh, does the technique entail? What it, how does it work as, uh, in a general sense? Sorry, I couldn't really cap capture Sorry. your... your uh... So could you just uh, uh, elaborate a bit on, uh, on the self distillation? On the what solution? What it is? <laughs> self distillation. Self distillation. Yes. Ah, yeah. So for self distillation, you use exactly the same um, architecture as a teacher model, and so the the teacher model is already trained, so it can already do a lot of stuff. And then you train a new model, and so how to train the 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 teacher model is with the real data, um, and then and then with uh, with a uh, with a uh, a student model, it has exactly the same architecture, but it has an aid on information which could be generated with a teacher model. So that's like an extra information that the model could get in the case of self-distillation. But in that case, it's not about like model compression anymore because they have like the same size. But it's still very interesting to say like it actually improves the, the result of the model. Yeah. So, one more. So I have a look if there's something from the online crowd. No. So then, thank you. Uh, oh. There's a one question. Oh. There. <laughs> oh, sorry. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Um, I wanted to ask: Does this method lead to overfitting? And have you looked at this, like from this angle, at this method? Overfitting, yeah. um, uh, self -dis uh, distillation in general. Yeah. Um, well, I don't think it would be because um, the whole training process that we are doing it has like this uh, validation process, and then our model is actually relatively small, so it doesn't, um, from its nature, doesn't have the capacity to overfit too much on the on the training data. Actually, um, the teacher model is. Um, are more precise about whatever prediction it generates. And then, however, our student model, it's not so sure which one is, is the case, but maybe it will predict like 60% it belongs to the organization, which doesn't really affect the result that much if it's 99% or 60%. Anyway, 60% is the maximum in comparison to all the other classes. So from nature, the um, because the, the student architecture is not um, uh, it doesn't incline to to overfitting. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. So, don't be shy. One more. Yeah, I see. <laughs> Thank you. It's on your slide, there is a thing about the Euro, Euro European Union example, yes. right? Yes. And then. There's two strange things. One is there's a negative possibility. Mm -hmm. And the second thing is why didn't you choose like the label as one zero zero but instead zero point eight and whatever the, uh, the it was uh, so yeah, it was not a um, distribution because uh, so in 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 the model firstly we will have output which is just like a numeric values and then normally we would like have a soft max matrix which to to make it to be a distribution. So that that um, that uh, digits number is not yet uh, the distribution of the data of the um, yeah of the classes. However, it suggests the same thing. So, 
then again, thank you very much. Thank Gucci. you. And thank you, and have a nice evening. Yeah?